Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Healthy Aging Lecture. We are going to get started in just one moment. I want to give everybody a chance to um, jump on the webinar, so just hold tight and we'll get started in, uh, in just a minute. Thank you. Okay, let's um, let's get rolling. Again, welcome everyone to our lecture today. My name is Kate Tutwapi. I'm the manager in the senior health department at Virginia Hospital Center, and I'm joined by Blanca, my coworker who also works in senior health. Um, we are going to be talking about the topic of stroke today, stroke prevention, uh, treatment, management, and recovery. So um, I'm going to be introducing our two guest speakers momentarily. Um, let me remind everyone that we do encourage your questions and hope to hear from you. Please look for that question or chat box that you see in your control panel and, and feel free to type those questions in as the presentation is going forward so you don't forget them. We'll get them to our speakers as soon as possible. Also remember that all of these lectures, this one included, are, be, are recorded. So anyone that registered for this webinar, even if they couldn't attend, um, will get a copy of the recording. And you're welcome to share that link with anyone that you think might be interested in the topic. Okay, um, I think that is the main housekeeping tips. Let me move ahead and introduce our guest speakers so we can get right into the um, discussion. So today we're joined by two clinicians who work at Virginia Hospital Center. We have in the back there, Sabina Passarella, who is a nurse practitioner um, with extensive experience and expertise in neurology, working on stroke management. Um, she is joined also by Ashley McKinley. Hi, Ashley. Um, Ashley is also a nurse with more than 10 years of nursing experience, and she heads up our, she is a coordinator for our stroke program at VHC. So we're delighted to have both of them here today and to share their, their knowledge, and um, I know they look forward to your questions as well. So with that, I'm going to hop off the screen and let um, Ashley and Sabina take it away. Thank you both. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley. I am the stroke coordinator here at Virginia Hospital Center. Just like she said, um, we're going to be talking about how to be smart with stroke. So um, we are going to um, talk about our facts, what a stroke is. We're going to go over some warning signs, some risk factors, and then some um, ways to prevent stroke and then um, some treatments for when we, uh, if a stroke does happen. And then I'm going to introduce Sabina here. I'm going to let her, her talk for a second and introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Sabina Passarello. I am a doctor of nursing practice, and I work with neurology here at Virginia Hospital Center with GW MFA Neurology. And I've been practicing in neurology for eight years, first as a bedside nurse and now as a nurse practitioner. And I focused my doctorate in nursing practice on the transitions of care related to stroke patients. So it is a passion of mine, and I'm happy to be here today to speak with all of you. I'm going to let Ashley introduce herself a little bit more, and we're going to get started on some of the discussion. Okay. So my name's Ashley. Like I said, um, I've been here at Virginia Hospital for 10 years. I worked in the ICU um, and then transitioned just recently this year, earlier back in April into the stroke coordinator role. Um, I have a master's and an MBA, uh, master's in nursing 
Um, and then, uh, so now I've been doing the stroke, the stroke roll probably about seven, eight months now. So um, we will jump into what we will be talking about with our, um, our stroke facts here. Um, so to go over just some, some things um, overall about stroke. So 80% of strokes are preventable. And that's, that's why we wanna have these conversations and get this education out to as many people as possible to help prevent strokes from happening. Um, it is the fifth leading cause of death in the US. Um, about 600,000 of these strokes are first time or new strokes. And then nearly one in four are people who have had a previous stroke. So you are at a higher risk if you um, have had a stroke for a reoccurring stroke. That is why you know, we want you to follow up with your doctor and make sure you're taking the appropriate care to, um, to manage that stroke. Um, some more stroke facts here. Um, stroke is the leading cause of long-term disability. It, uh, uh, at least 200,000 deaths a year from heart disease and stroke uh, are preventable. So yet again, it is preventable, some of these um, strokes. So we wanna make sure that you know, our, our uh, communities are being educated on how to get to the hospital quickly because um, time is of the essence in these strokes. So we just wanna make sure that everyone is a, can recognize a stroke in a timely fashion and get either themselves or their loved ones to the hospital quickly. Um, another thing to look at is, and I know, you know the cost in, in our healthcare is, um, can be quite a, a topic to discuss, but stroke in itself costs about 46 billion annually. So between the healthcare services, the, the medications, the disabilities that cause um, loss of productivity, all of these things can um, add up to, to adding uh, the stroke cost to our nation, to our healthcare system. And with some of these being preventable, we are able, if we get the education out and get um, you know, to the communities, we can help with this cost of stroke. Okay, so I'm going to let Sabina take over and talk about what a stroke is. Okay, so what is a stroke? When we talk about a stroke, um, understanding a stroke is essentially another term for it is a brain attack. It's a sudden interruption of blood flow to the brain um, where oxygen is cut off and areas of the body that are controlled by that part of the brain lose function. So the brain um, cells in the body need blood and oxygen and nutrients to work. And so when that blood flow is blocked, you can have a stroke or a TIA. Um, and we're gonna talk about two main types of strokes as well as TIAs, but the main types of stroke are hemorrhagic and ischemic. And so this is a little bit of a diagram of what the two types of strokes look like in the brain. A hemorrhagic stroke is caused by burst capillaries or burst blood vessels. And an ischemic stroke is caused by obstructed blood vessels, um, typically by clots or some other obstruction that prevents blood flow from getting to that area of the brain. Talking about a hemorrhagic stroke, so this is a little bit less common than the other strokes, the ischemic strokes. Um, this is when blood vessels rupture or burst in the brain and bleeding can occur around and into areas of the brain. And this accounts for about 13% of all strokes. Ischemic strokes are much more common. Uh, about 87% of all strokes are ischemic strokes. And these are caused by an actual blockage of the blood flow in the area of the brain. And it causes the brain cells in that area to, to die. And so there's permanent brain damage and long-term impairments from an ischemic stroke. And so as you can see in the picture here, there's a, a blood clot there that's causing blockage of blood flow to the area of the brain. And so whatever that area that's affected, whatever that area controls, what part of the body, your speech, um, that is what the effects are on the body. And that's the symptoms and the impact that you're gonna have from that stroke. A stroke is also considered a brain attack. So when we think of heart attack and the emergency of that, a brain attack is the most descriptive and realistic description of a stroke. And it's a, a, a call to action by your body. And it's 
because your brain is the most delicate and most vital organ in the body. And so you need to have the same degree of an emergency level of care as you would for a heart attack. And it's crucial to recognize the symptoms and respond quickly enough so that you can receive treatment in time. And treatment for a brain attack is available and there are lots of options that are available to you, but only in a certain time window um, from when those symptoms start. So it's important to call 911 so that you're able to get immediate assistance. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about treatment a little bit more um, for the different kinds of strokes. Unfortunately, one thing that's important to remember is unfortunately, the average American, it takes them about 12 to 24 hours to get to the hospital after experiencing their first stroke symptom. And this is why it's important that we all learn to recognize stroke symptoms and how to respond appropriately. So um, Ashley's gonna be talking a little bit about some of the warning signs. Okay, so some, some things to remember um, is to think and act fast. So with that uh, acronym here, to act fast, you have your, your face, your arm, your speech and time. So, you know, if it's a loved one, recognizing a stroke is critical and getting it treated quick, quickly. Um, so with the face, you know, you wanna make sure you ask the person to smile um, with the arms, like are they able to lift both arms up? Does one drift downward? It does, do they have slurred speech? Um, if any of these things are, are happening, you want to make sure you call 911 and get them um, to the hospital, the closest stroke center um, as quickly as possible. Um, re some reasons why people don't seek immediate treatment, they, they don't recognize the symptoms quickly enough. Um, they can be in some denial and try and, um, you know, explain away their symptoms, the, you know, the numbness, if they're, they're, their face, their, um, their weakness. Um, they worry about the cost of care. You know, that's always a big, um, you know, on everyone's mind is their, their health care. Um, they think the symptoms will go away. Um, you know, a timely response to a stroke is the best way to increase survivability and to reduce the associated disabilities. So the faster that you respond to the symptoms of a stroke, the better chances the victim will, sur will survive and the less risk of them having long-term disabilities. So just as an example here, we have a picture of what, you know, when I talked about the face and having someone smile, you can see here that part of his face, so half of, um, on one side, his, he has a, a droop to what, you know, a droop to his, his smile. So that would be one example of, um, uh, 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 to get to the hospital, to get your loved one to the hospital. So here we have, um, we're talking about TIA or mini stroke. Um, so a TIA is a, um, a transient ischemic attack, also known as a mini stroke. So these are brief episodes of stroke symptoms. They resolve within minutes or hours. Stroke symptoms tend to last longer. And it's usually caused by one of three things. Um, low blood flow at a narrow part of an artery carrying the blood to the brain, such as the carotid. Um, another um, cause could be a blood clot in another part of the brain or another part of the body, such as the heart, that breaks off and travels to the brain and blocks the, a blood vessel in the brain, or a narrowing of a smaller blood vessel um, that could be blocking some blood flow for a short period of time. And it is important to seek immediate medical attention if you suspect that you are having a TIA. The doctor will, will do some quick, simple checks to test your vision, your muscle strength, your ability to think and speak. Um, some diagnostic testing would consist of a CT or an MRI scan of the brain and the carotid arteries to determine a possible cause of the TIA. So a TIA is a strong predictor of stroke risk, and almost about 40% of TIA patients will have a stroke in the future. So it is important to, if you are having any of these symptoms, to go to the hospital 
Um, if they resolve, they, they can do these scans and see and get you on the correct treatment to help prevent a stroke in the future. So here um, in the in our region, we do have several certified stroke centers. That is, you know, one one great thing about living in this area is that we are surrounded by such amazing hospitals. So it's a, it's always important to to know where your stroke centers are to get to make sure that your loved ones get to the correct hospital. Um, if you call 911, the EMS they they can get you to the right place as well. So you want to make sure that you call the appropriate. Um, people and that you're not, you know, doing it on your own, call 911 and they'll get your loved one to the right center. But here are just some places, um, Virginia Hospital Center, we are a stroke center, um, Washington Hospital, Georgetown, GW, Inova, they're all um, stroke centers. And then there is a stroke awareness app. Um, it's Stroke Awareness Foundation. It is on Apple and Android. I actually downloaded it to my phone as well. Um, so if you are on vacation, if you are, you know, at your families or if you're worried, worried about loved ones um, and want to make sure that they are close to stroke centers, I looked up my parents' address to see where the closest um, stroke center is to them, just so I'm aware, you know, if they, they call with, um, they're feeling anything, I can make sure that they get to the right center or I know where the closest center is. So I actually have this um, app on my phone as well. It's a good it's a good tool to have to, to and it also one good thing about the app is that um, it will send an emergency text if you you put in contact whoever your emergency alert and it'll send um, that person a call or a text to let them know that there is something going on okay so some perceptions about stroke myth versus reality so the first myth here is that stroke is not preventable. Um, obviously, we've already said that we can prevent strokes, and so up to 80% of strokes are preventable. Another myth is that it cannot be treated. Stroke has, it's an emergency treatment. Um, that is why it's so important to get to the hospital as quickly as possible, because there is a small window after that initial um, symptom that you can get this emergency treatment. Uh, stroke only strikes the elderly. And actually, you know, we've been finding that, you know, anyone can have a stroke. 34% um, of people hospitalized were younger than 65. So 34% of people hospitalized are younger than 65. So that is important to make sure that everyone is aware of these stroke symptoms. Um, you know, people in their 30s, 40s, younger, uh, we've seen anyone across the board. So you just want to make sure that we recognize these symptoms early and get them to the hospital. Another myth is that the stroke, a stroke happens in the heart. And a stroke, another term is the brain attack, uh, which Sabina had talked about. So just like a heart attack, a stroke is a brain attack and it is blood flow being blocked in the, the brain. And then the last myth here that we have um, is that a stroke recovery ends after six months. And stroke recovery is, it can last, last a lifetime. Um, just when we had gone over the stroke facts, that stroke is the number one disease that causes uh, long-term disability. So that is why it's so important to get treatment quickly. Okay, so now I'm gonna give it back over to Sabina to talk about some risk factors. <clears throat> Thank you. So when we talk about risk factors for stroke, there are um, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Non-modifiable risk factors are ones that you can't really control for, but they're ones that are important for you to know about. Um, so as we age, our, in, our risk for stroke increases and age, um, it doubles every decade past the age of 55. Um, now, gender, women are at a higher risk of death from stroke. We've seen that strokes kill more than twice as many women annually than breast cancer. Um, and as far as race, African Americans are at two times the risk of Caucasians of having stroke, and Hispanics and Asian Pacific Islanders are also at a higher risk than Caucasians. 
Type 1 diabetes is a risk factor you can't control. Um, type 2 diabetes, Ashley's probably going to talk about a little bit more. That's one that can be controlled because you can treat that um, and you can, it's, its onset is during the adult period of your life. Um, a previous stroke or a family history of stroke, those are things that you can't really control for and they do increase your risk of stroke. So talking a little bit about women and stroke, um, stroke is the third leading cause of death behind heart disease and cancer for women. And more women than men die from stroke. Um, for men, it's about the fifth leading cause of death behind heart disease, cancer, um, unintentional injuries, and chronic lower respiratory diseases. And there are additional risk factors for women related to stroke. So taking birth control pills, um, being pregnant. So we know that pregnancy naturally increases your blood pressure and the stress on the heart. So that can put you in an increased risk for stroke. Um, using hormone replacement therapy. So that's a combined hormone therapy of progestin and estrogen, and that can help relieve menopausal symptoms, but it does put you at a slightly increased risk for stroke being on it. And then suffering migraines. So data is still being collected on this relationship between migraines and stroke, but migraines can increase a women's risk for stroke. Um, by two and a half times. And most people in the US who suffer from migraines are women. And so signs of migraine headache with auras can mimic signs of TIAs and strokes. And that can lead to potential misdiagnoses and negligence of actual strokes in women. So these are all important things to be mindful of and to be aware of. With regard to risk related to race, we talked a little bit about the African American community and that increased risk for stroke. So there's a, it's nearly twice as high a risk for stroke in African-Americans than for Caucasians. And African-Americans are also more likely to die following a stroke than whites. African-Americans suffer more extensive physical impairments from stroke. And there's no particular reason that African-Americans or any other minority is at a higher risk for stroke, but it's a combination of factors, mainly composed of modifiable risk factors listed here. So hypertension, diabetes, obesity, smoking, sickle cell anemia in these communities, these are the risk factors that need to be monitored and taken care of in order to reduce that risk for stroke. Um, in the Hispanic community, language barrier is one of the reasons that they've identified that puts um, Hispanic members at a higher risk for stroke. So it's important to be mindful of the risk based on race and what we can do in those communities to prevent stroke risk and to prevent complications from stroke. Like I said, Ashley is going to talk a little bit about the risk factors that are mod modifiable that you can control. Okay, so some modifiable risk factors. So these are the ones that you can control. And so first we have um, smoking, um, excessive alcohol consumption, being overweight or obese. Um, oh, sorry. There we go. Um, or lack of exercise. So you want to make sure that you're exercising, you are keeping a healthy um, weight, you want to, um, you know, keep your alcohol consumption down. And obviously, if we do want to, we stress to quit smoking. Okay, so another modifiable um, risk factor here is high blood pressure. Um, this puts stress on the blood vessels and it increases risk of stroke by four to six times. Um, we can, so some things that we can do to help our blood pressure, we can reduce our sodium and fat intake, um, take your medications. If you are on medications to control your blood pressure, you want to make sure that you are taking those as prescribed and you want to exercise regularly. Um, you want to, you know, also it's a good idea to keep um, an eye on your blood pressure to take it at home, uh, make sure that, you know, it is in a well-contained um, range. High blood pressure is um, considered blood pressure that is consistently over um, 130 over 80. So anything above that consistently, you want to make sure that, you know, if you're taking your medications, 
Um, because uncontrolled high blood pressure can lead to stroke by damaging and weaken, weakening the, the blood vessels, and it can cause them to narrow, rupture, or leak. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are controlling that blood pressure. Okay, the next one here is high cholesterol. Um, so uh, high cholesterol can increase the risk of heart disease. Uh, high cholesterol is considered a level of of your total cholesterol over 200, um, there's usually no symptoms with that. That is, um, you, this is with a, um, a lab test that your doctor will usually perform. So you wanna make sure that you are getting your, your physical and that your, your doctor is checking your cholesterol. Um, some things that you can do is reduce your dietary fat. Yet again, we wanna exercise regularly. That keeps popping up, so it must be pretty important. Um, and then we wanna include fruits and vegetables into five or more servings a day. And then if you are on some medications to control your cholesterol, then you wanna take those as prescribed. So you wanna make sure that you're taking your medications, exercising, and then also diet. So you wanna make sure you're, you're getting the correct diet, decreasing the fat and increasing your vegetables and fruits. Okay. So then heart disease. Heart disease increases your risk um, by up to six times. Um, coronary artery disease can lead to blockages. And then atrial fibrillation can cause blood pools or clots that can move to your brain and cause a stroke. So some solutions here to help with um, heart disease is uh, to quit smoking. We want to make sure that, you know, if if your loved one, if you know someone that is smoking, that you know you either refer them to to the doctor to to get help and make sure they get the the support um, they need to to quit smoking. We want to exercise regularly and to maintain a a good weight, a normal um, a normal weight, and to lose that excess weight. Um, let's see. So then the next thing we have here is um, previous stroke or TIA. So this, is the, if you have a previous stroke, it is a 42% chance of reoccurrence in men and a 24% chance of reoccurrence with women. Um, a previous TIA, we had, we had talked about TIAs earlier that 40% of people who have had a TIA will have an actual stroke. And then nearly half of all strokes occur within the first few days after a TIA. So uh, you do wanna make sure that you are um, being mindful of those symptoms and getting to, uh, you know, talking to your doctor, getting on a um, prevention regimen. Um, they may put you on aspirin or any other medication, but you do wanna make sure that you consult your doctor. Um, Reoccurrent strokes often have a higher rate of death and disability because parts of the brain are already injured by that original stroke. So we do want to make sure that you're taking your medications. If you have had a stroke, you want to you know, be very diligent uh, with your medications and with your follow-up. Uh, you want to make sure that you do all those appointments that they make um, in the hospital, following up with your doctor, with the neurologist. You want to make sure that you do follow up and go to those appointments. Okay, so smoking, we do wanna talk about smoking because it's so important. Um, so the bad news with smoking is that it doubles the risk of stroke. It damages your blood vessels, it causes artery congestion uh, to occur more quickly, it can raise your blood pressure, and it makes your heart work harder. So the good news about um, smoking is that if you stop right now, in one year, the risk of stroke drops to less than one half of that of a, a smoker. Um, and then in five to 15 years, the risk drops to the same as a non-smoker. So by stopping right now, you can repair some damage of, that smoking has done. So you wanna make sure um, that if you or one of your loved ones smokes, that you do talk to them about quitting and the importance of not smoking. Okay, lastly here we have weight. So 
So we had talked about exercise and um, maintaining a healthy weight. So the excess weight can strain your circulatory system and it increases the chances of diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart disease, which all of these things we have talked about causing a higher risk for stroke. So with you know maintaining a healthy weight, you can decrease all of the um, these chances of these um, diseases, which can decrease the chance of stroke. Okay, so we're gonna let um, Sabina talk about prevention and treatment. Okay, so for stroke prevention, it's really important to identify your own personal risk factors for stroke. Um, I always tell patients you want to be your own advocate or for family members who are caregivers. You want to know your blood pressure, your cholesterol levels, what existing medical conditions that you have that put you at an increased risk for stroke, and how can you prevent stroke by managing those. Um, so like Ashley said, making recommended lifestyle changes, maintaining a healthy weight, exercising regularly, eating a healthy diet, and stopping smoking. And small changes can make a significant difference. So with weight loss, losing five pounds, if you can do that, you can lose another five. Um, so you can start small, but that can make a significant impact on your overall risk for stroke. Like I said, there are acute stroke treatments and they're different for ischemic stroke versus hemorrhagic stroke. So when we are treating an ischemic stroke, the two main things that we think of are whether you are a candidate for a medication called um, tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, or whether you're at an eligible um, time point for a clot removing device, a mercy retriever, penumbra, or a procedure called a thrombectomy. So TPA is an enzyme that's um, found naturally in the body and it was approved by the FDA in 1996 and it's been used since then. And it treats the brain attacks by dissolving blood clots that are blocking arteries in the brain. Now, if given promptly, one in three patients who receive TPA resolve their symptoms or have a major improvement in their stroke symptoms. So it can have really significant effects. Um, now, not everyone is a candidate for TPA, and so that's why it's important to speak with your doctor about whether you are a candidate for it. Um, certain things might put you outside of the window for TPA based on timing, but other things that can affect your candidacy include medications that you're on, including blood thinners, or whether you've had a recent stroke, a recent surgery, um, or any recent bleeding in the body. And so those are just examples of some of them. Um, now, when we talk about the Mercy Retriever and the Penumbra, these are devices that are used by a specialist, um, either a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, or an interventional radiologist, who all have the ability to go in with these special devices and try to remove the clot that's blocking blood flow in the brain, therefore opening that area of the brain back to blood flow, and hopefully saving the territory that was being affected by stroke. Um, so those are the two main kind of procedures that we have for acute treatment of ischemic stroke. When we talk about a hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding in the brain, the process for treating that is different. And that requires usually a, neuro, um, a neurosurgeon or a neurologist who can do endovascular procedures. So um, if bleeding is caused by an aneurysm in the brain, there are procedures where a neurosurgeon can go in and go ahead and clip that aneurysm by clipping the neck of the aneurysm to stop blood flow from flowing into the brain. If clipping is not a procedure that can be done, um, an endovascular procedure can be done where um, a, neuro, a neurosurgeon or a trained neurologist can go in and put coils into the aneurysm that fill the aneurysm and prevent blood flow from going through the aneurysm and causing additional bleeding in the brain. So there's different methods of treatment. These are some of them. Of course, all of these have to be considered with the experts, the physicians, and then in discussion with you and family members. As far as stroke recovery goes, about 10% of stroke survivors recover almost completely. About 25% recover with minor impairments. 
40% experience moderate to severe impairments requiring special care, and 10% require care within either a skilled care facility or another long-term care facility, and we'll discuss this a little bit later. And about 15% die shortly after a stroke, unfortunately. And when we talk about types of stroke rehabilitation, there are a lot of key players here that help um, with recovery. And a lot of that is involving our therapists. So physical therapists are gonna work on walking, range of motion, things like balance, um, foot drop. They can help with one-sided paralysis by increasing strength. Occupational therapists are gonna help with um, taking care of yourself. So relearning skills needed for everyday living, things like eating, bathing, dressing, and taking care of yourself throughout the day. They can also help with determining a return to work and what that will look like in the future. Speech language therapy is really imperative for people who have aphasia or communication deficits, as well as swallowing, which can be impacted by different types of strokes, and cognition. And we'll talk a little bit more about it, but memory and cognition do have effects from stroke and that can be long-term. And so getting set up with speech therapy can be really pivotal in a recovery process. And then there's also recreational therapy. So regaining enjoyable skills that you like and pastimes and hobbies like cooking, gardening, sewing, playing cards, things like that. These activities can also help stroke survivors regain some of their lost thinking abilities and physical capabilities. So we always encourage people to remain active and engaged in the things that they love to do because that can help with recovery as well. Now, stroke is a very debilitating diagnosis and it does involve a lot of life changes for stroke survivors and family members and caregivers. Um, after stroke, both the survivor and their family are often concerned about being on their own at home. And among common issues, you know, these are some of them, but there are behavior changes. Um, so partners need to be aware of the reasons for the stroke survivor's behavior without looking um, past the possibility that someone may have developed depression or anger. Um, we do talk a lot about depression in the aftercare for stroke because many people who have a stroke do suffer from some level of depression because of the effects that it has on their work life their home life and just their ability to be independent like they were before. Um, and then there's emotional ability, which means that some people can have experiences where they have sudden laughing or crying. And it may seem really abnormal, but this can be an effect of stroke. And so it's important to talk with your doctor about this because there are forms of treatment for it um, and forms of therapy. And then neglect. So um, a lot of the times with more severe strokes, people can have a neglect of one side of their body where they're not paying any attention to it at all, or they can't see on one side. So it's important for um, family members and caregivers to be educated about these things, to try and help with them and to accommodate for them. So um, it may be eating only on one side of the dinner plate, only recognizing one side of a clock. Those things are really important and to be mindful of that. Um, we talked a little bit about memory loss and cognition, and there are cognitive changes that can occur, and people who have significant strokes can be at risk of having something called vascular dementia, which can be subtle, and it might be overlooked by family members at first. So monitoring cognition and memory can be a really important factor after stroke, and that can be done with your, your primary care provider, your neurologist, or with the speech and language pathologists. And then communication problems. Um, so stroke can cause damage to the language center of the brain, making it difficult to understand information and to speak and communicate. And all of these things are going to be important to know about and to work with um, during recovery. There are different types of recovery, and it's essentially based on the kind of stroke that you've had and the severity of that stroke. And this is something that's evaluated while someone is in the hospital, and it can be continued in the outpatient setting. So um, many general hospitals now offer a variety of rehabilitation services. These can include things like acute rehabilitation, um, subacute or transitional care units, 
or long-term care facilities like skilled nursing facilities. Um, in an inpatient rehabilitation facility, patients are admitted to the hospital and they have to be able to tolerate at least three hours of rigorous therapy during the day to, um, to be qualified for this type of facility. Um, there's also home therapy that can be done and outpatient therapy based on your needs and insurance coverage. And then long-term care facilities or skilled nursing facilities that plan for the, the longer term deficits. Um, and then of course, there are also community-based programs and organizations that provide stroke caregivers and stroke victims with support groups and resources for other individuals who've experienced similar situations. So you can reduce the impact of a stroke. Um, it's important to know that a stroke is essentially a brain attack, but it's oftentimes preventable and it's oftentimes treatable and it just needs the appropriate attention. So remember the three R's of stroke and act fast. So reduce the risk, follow the recommendations of your doctors, the National Stroke Association Stroke Prevention Guidelines, um, recognize those stroke symptoms that Ashley was talking about and respond by calling 911. Um, you wanna act fast. We always say time is brain. And so the faster that you can get to the hospital, the more quickly we can make decisions about whether you are appropriate for treatment and give that treatment to hopefully optimize um, brain recovery or retrieval and, and saving areas of the brain that can be saved before they're permanently damaged. Um, so make sure that when you respond immediately, you're calling 911. Um, one thing that we always recommend is um, do not drive to the hospital, do not ask a family member to drive you. Make sure that you're calling 911 and EMS because the emergency medical services are trained to evaluate for stroke. They have specific things that they're able to do in the ambulance and they also call ahead to a stroke center to give a uh, forewarning so that the stroke team can be there. They can be waiting at those ER doors to get everything started. So um, that's one thing that is really important to remember every minute matters. Don't drive yourself, don't have family drive you, call 911, okay? So just some um, uh, Virginia Hospital Center resources here. Um, so if you, we have an inpatient rehab facility uh, in-house that is, they're fantastic, they're great, um, they're a great resource. Um, they do a lot with stroke. Um, in the community, um, and then also some medical services. We do have a, um, some resources here for acute stroke. And then some other resources that you can do if you want to do a little bit more research, uh, mayoclinic.org, stroke.org is a great resource, um, strokeassociation.org, American Heart Association is not on here. Um, I should have put it on here. Um, that is also a great resource as well. Um, CDC is a great resource, um, but stroke.org and American Heart are, are both very um, user-friendly websites. They're very easy to navigate. They're very easy to read as well. So those two I would highly recommend. Um, just wanted to do an important disclaimer here is that to always seek medical advice from your physician, um, and make sure that you are following up with your physicians. If you have any um, questions about your, your own health, um, just follow up with your um, primary um, physician. And then any questions? Do we have any questions here? Great, thank you so much, Sabina and Ashley. That was wonderful. Lots of um, rich information I think we all, all need to hear. And I think it's just an excellent reminder that those steps, those kind of Simple steps about exercise and nutrition, so important for our brain health. And they work, I mean, that's what we do for our heart health too, right? So, you know, if you get in that walk, eat those leafy greens, you're really helping, helping your body out in so many ways. Um, I did want to mention, and maybe you guys can um, speak to this a little bit. My understanding is there is a, I'm sorry if you touched on this, a stroke survivor support group that does meet um, online through, through Zoom, um, both for families and caregivers. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. They meet, I believe it's the second or third Wednesday of the month. 
I think um, it's the second. Yeah, the second Wednesday. Second. Okay. Yeah, and they yeah they do a Zoom um, right now. I, th I believe it's still on Zoom. Wonderful. Great. Just wanted to mention that for folks who might be interested. So um, a couple questions that rolled in. Um, is there a genetic component related to um, to having a stroke? If it you know if it's something your your dad, your mom, your grandparent experienced. So I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, there is, there are things that um, it's important to mention that if you have a family history of stroke, because we do know that it does increase your risk for stroke. So there is some genetic component. Um, now that is multifactorial because it could be that, you know, several members in the family have those risk factors of high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, diabetes. And so maybe those were their risk factors for stroke and that's why they had stroke and they've passed those down. Um, so it's not something necessarily that we can say this is the gene that links it, but it's something where we can say if your family members have a history of stroke, it puts you at an increased risk and it's something that's important for you to mention to your primary care provider so that once they know that information, they can do a little bit of a dive into your personal risk and see what puts you at risk for stroke um, related to your family members. Thank you, great. Great question. Wonderful. Um, another question, does the type of stroke affect recovery rate? Um, I mean, in other words, is it easy, quote unquote easier to recover from some, some strokes versus others or how? how we, we saw the rates you put up there and only 10% have a full recovery. Is that associated with any particular kind of stroke or is it not really? Defer to you. Sure. Um, so it's, it's taken into context of each person's stroke. So each individual, you know, has a different kind of stroke as far as what the size of that stroke is, what the location of the brain is. So if it's a larger stroke, your risk of survivability is lower. Um, if it's a tiny stroke in an area of the brain that is not a significantly important area of the brain, you might not have any symptoms from it or very few symptoms that resolve very quickly. So it there are different factors that go into play. Of course, hemorrhagic strokes, bleeding in the brain are at a higher risk for mortality and death. Um, they just have a tendency to be more severe and more significant. Um, that being said, sometimes we've seen people with smaller areas of bleeding and, and they do fairly well. So um, there's a lot of things that we take into context when we talk about your risk of death or disability from the stroke. And it's it's a little bit, it varies um, sure. definitely person to person. Okay, great. So we have a couple of questions related to um, modifiable risk factors. Um, first one related to smoking. If, well, how, what about if if you're around somebody who smokes um, or vapes? Um, I, I guess there would be the risk of secondhand smoking, but maybe vaping, I'm not sure <laughs> if that plays into it as well. Um, so I'm not sure the specifics about um, vaping. Yeah, you don't know enough about vaping. Or secondhand smoke, what that, what that risk implies. I mean, we know that any level of smoke it has damage to the lungs. And so, you know, we always are encouraging people that if you're in a household where someone smokes, um, to engage them in conversation, see what their level of motivation to quit smoking is because it can have health benefits for everyone. Um, vaping, I don't, I don't think there's a significant amount of research related to vaping and stroke or secondhand risk with vaping and stroke, but um, vaping is is not something that we promote at all, um, and you know it might be thought of as safer than smoking cigarettes, but um, it certainly has its own risks. Okay. I don't think there's enough research right now for for mm -hmm. um, for vaping, but what I I tend to tell some of my my friends and family um, is you know when smoking first came out, everyone thought it was, you know, you, you, nobody really thought there was a lot of um, detriment to your health. And now, you know, decades later, we're seeing the, the effects of it. So just to remember that of what you're putting in your body does you want to anything, whether what are you're eating, 
um, smoking, vaping, you want to just be mindful of what you're putting in your body. Makes sense. Yes. Um, and then the, another question related to um, exercise and any recommendations on the type of exercise. I any input? <laughs> sure. Um, th this is a this is a great question. Generally, what I say is, you know, we would love it if you would do 30 to 45 minutes of exercise daily and enough exercise to get your heart rate up. Um, now, you know, people, especially after stroke, everyone has varying levels of ability to do exercise. And so a lot of it starts with what are you capable of and what do you enjoy? What's something that you're going to be able to keep up with in the long term? So sometimes, you know, for people, it's as simple as starting by just going on daily walks and then increasing that gradually. Um, I like to encourage people to do hobbies. So if they played tennis before, if they swam, starting with things like that, because um, we don't want to encourage people to do exercise that they really don't enjoy and that they can't keep up in the long term. Great. Thank you so much. So now a couple, we're going to turn to a couple questions related to if you've experienced a stroke and are, you know, kind of in a recovery phase. Um, first question is, does a patient need to see a neurologist from there on out after you've had a stroke? Is that um, just part of your routine care then to see a neurologist or how does that work? Sure. So um, typically what we like to do is you should be seen by a neurologist, at least in the immediate time period when you've had the stroke or the TIA, um, to evaluate you for the risk factors to try and determine what may have caused it and the best way to prevent it from happening again or treating it. If you require a neurologist in the long term, it's a little bit dependent on your stroke and the type of stroke and whether we were able to find a cause or not. So if we can't find a cause in the hospital. Typically, we like you to continue on with a workup to try and figure out a cause. And that may take anywhere from six months to a year um, or even beyond that. Um, but usually, you have a follow up with a neurologist from the hospital. Um, if it's easy to identify what your cause was and the risk factors that you have, sometimes neurologists are comfortable with then having your primary care manage those risks and to help prevent a further stroke. So a lot of the times it's working with your primary care um, to see if you require a level of care from a neurologist or not. Um, a lot of the times we'll see patients for a certain amount of time, whether it be three months, six months to a year. And then at that point, we're comfortable saying, we've identified that your stroke was most likely from high blood pressure, say, we're gonna keep you on this blood thinner or aspirin and then we're gonna make sure that you continue to follow up with your primary care to make sure that your blood pressure is well managed to prevent another stroke. So we might hand over that level of care to your primary care at that point. Okay, great, thank you. And, and one other related to um, starting therapy, um, perhaps you've seen individuals who, who are, you know, do experience depression after having a stroke and they're not able to get right into therapy, like what is the um, impact or if, if they do delay therapy due to work, maybe working through some um, depression or mental health issues? Have you, have you encountered that or is there, is there a risk if, they, if, if therapy is delayed? So, um, so depression is, is tricky. It might not show up immediately after a stroke. Um, typically, we monitor for it in the hospital um, when we follow up after the hospital stay, and then we monitor for it again at each appointment afterwards. Um, and primary care has their own form of monitoring for it. Um, typically, one of the biggest things that I recommend that we spoke about fairly recently is the stroke survivor group, um, because while we as care providers, while we see stroke on a day-to-day -day basis, um, there's something unique about meeting with people who shared in that experience and family members who are caregivers who shared in that experience and what that looks like in the long term. And so um, joining a stroke survivor group can be a very therapeutic thing for patients who are suffering from mild depression symptoms. 
Um, and then I would encourage you to speak with your primary care about it as well so that they can get you resources if you need counseling, if you need to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and if down the road medication might be required for depression. That's great. And I also, we had someone from the audience comment that the depression may not be with just the person who experienced the stroke, but also their, their loved one. I mean, that, that's a big change in everyone's life um, if, if you're living with someone or caring for someone. So I think that's, that speaks again to, you know, getting that support, whether it's through a support group or some other mechanism. So yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. Okay. Um, I think we've worked through the bulk of the questions. I'll give it another minute in case anybody had, wants to type in something more. Um, but this has been a really good discussion. Thank you both so much for the information and for joining us today. Um, and I hope the audience, everyone will, will come back and join us again in November, November 19th for another Healthy Aging Lecture. That topic will be, um, we're gonna have an occupational therapist join us for that discussion and she is going to talk about different tools and ideas that seniors older adults of all abilities um, have found useful in their home kind of some creative ways to, to maintain your safety maintain your independence as you're, li as you're living um, in your home so i think that should be a wonderful discussion as well so let me just do another quick check here before i sign us off um, Good. I think that's I think that's it. As I you all will receive a recording of this. I will include the PowerPoint slides as well when I send this out, and also um, some information about some of our resources here at the hospital if you want to follow up with with the team here. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you, Sabina and Ashley. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend, and um, until until next month, everyone take care. Bye bye. Bye, thank you so you. much. Bye-bye. <clears throat>